The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 167 of the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Yes, I am back. My chest is feeling better. I'm not coughing anymore. I I feel like I have finally gotten past the COVID and I feel so much better. Uh, just a little twinge in my back is all that's left because I did throw out my back in the middle of it. <laughs> and believe me, that was no fun. But you know what? But we're not here to talk about me and getting over COVID. We're here today to talk about my guest, Gary Morgenstein. Uh, return guest. He was with us last year in May of 2020, episode 118, talking about his first book in the Dark Depth series, A Mound Over Hell. And today he's back to talk about the sequel, book two that's coming out in just a couple of weeks, A Fastball for Freedom. Oh my gosh, it's such an exciting book and I can't wait to share that with you. We have a Gary and I have a really fantastic conversation, as always, every time I talk to Gary. It's always a lot of fun. There's always so much wonderful insight. Uh, We are discussing, you know, the idiosyncrasies of writing and habits. Uh, We touch on faith. And when I say faith, it may not be what what you're thinking, what your mind immediately goes to. So uh, look, listen for that. Uh, We have characters that stick around and or take over a story. Uh, using Zoom for theater, because that's exactly what he's been up to, uh, which we're going to learn all about, uh, including his Broadway show, Black and White Cookie, and his upcoming series, Joyland, that he he wrote and is going to be airing very, very soon. So make sure you listen to this interview and uh, click the link in the show notes for Gary, so that way you know where to go and what to find out because this is some exciting stuff that he has been up to and so like i said make sure uh at the end of this that you're clicking the link in the show notes for gary uh so that you can follow him on his website and on his social media so you don't miss out when his when his other shows come on uh plus his new book coming out on uh, march 25th just a couple weeks away and it's funny because in the middle of all this he's got the uh, his his new show Joyland on March twenty second, uh, the new book on March twenty fifth, and somewhere in between there, his wife's birthday. So, uh, so Gary, please, on behalf of everybody here at Sample Chapter Podcast, w- I wish your wife happiest of birthdays for us. <laughs> anyway, listeners, I-, I want you to click those links in the show notes for Gary. Uh, don't forget to also look us up on social media. We do have a media presence on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can follow us in there. Uh, we share things uh, fairly regularly. Uh, haven't as much uh, when I was down with COVID. Honestly, I just had no motivation for anything. I hardly wrote. And, and it's funny because you know, the first thing I thought when I found out I had COVID and I was going to get to spend two weeks at home resting, my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, I'm going to do some interviews. I'm going to do so much writing. No, hardly at all. It's crazy how that uh, just sapped my energy and was just like, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to do that. But you can still follow us on social media. (laughs) That was my point that I was trying to make was that uh, you can still follow us on social media and I'm getting better about uh, getting back into the rhythm again of sharing things regularly, uh, old episodes, uh, fun things, links to our sponsors and podcast friends, all that kind of stuff. If you're not a social media person, but you'd like to reach out to the show, you can do so via email at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, I have a whole lot of emails to catch up on. I'm back to uh, trying to catch up on those again. So if you're listening to this and you've already sent me an email, I'm going to go back and reach out to you. Uh, If you don't hear from me soon, please send me another email. As a reminder, it may have gotten buried and all the other, uh, you know, I get a lot of junk as well. So uh, send me another email. And of course, if uh, if you don't want to email, maybe you just want to make a comment on the show or an episode, you can do so by calling 660-851-1146 and leave that voicemail. And uh, of course, uh, I will play that on an upcoming episode. 
it'll be lots of fun. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about our sponsors for, for just a moment. Uh, they do help provide everything that uh, takes place for the show. And I, I actually have some other things I'm working on right now. They had to get put on the back burner while I was uh, down with COVID. But now that I'm feeling healthy again, I'm going to try and get going on this other stuff. So I'll bring that information to you as I can. But first of all, I want to talk about Scrivener, my favorite writing software. And I tell you, now that I'm feeling better, it's been so good to get back into my writing on Scrivener. And thank goodness, Scrivener has so much information about your story. Because I've got it filled out with all my characters on the left-hand side. Uh, scenes or breakdowns, information about uh, places. Because it's funny how much you forget in just a short time away. And I get back into a scene and all of a sudden I'm going, wait a minute, what was that character's name again? I had to look over the side and find it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay, great. It's Roger. You know, or whatever. Scrivener is just so much goodness there uh, to help you write that story. Check out this advertisement for Scrivener and how you could save 20% on the regular desktop version. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing cork board, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. And thank you once again to Scrivener. Now I'd like to jump over to our, uh, not, a, not a sponsor per se, but somebody that we have partnered with, which is Audible. Audible is offering through us a free 30-day trial, and of course you get a free book with that trial so and it's yours to keep whether you go on and keep your membership or not so that's a really cool thing just all you gotta do is click the link in the show notes or go to audibletrial.com slash sample chapter i believe that's the correct link um click the link <laughs> that's the better thing to do uh and and you can start your trial today like i said get that free book and uh, try it out i just finished another audiobook yesterday i listen to audiobooks on a regular basis maybe two or three a month on top of the paperbacks and ebooks and hardbacks that I'm reading on a regular basis as well. Uh, but Audible helps me keep on top of the, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the books that I really want to get into every year. So here's, uh, once again, we have another advertisement for you to, uh, to listen to with all the details on Audible. Hello friends, Jason here. And I wanted to take a moment to tell you about a great offer from Audible. Like you, I'm very busy. I have a full-time job, a family, I'm a thriller author, and I do this weekly podcast. But I also love to read. That's where Audible is a lifesaver for me. Whether I'm mowing the yard, working out, driving back and forth to work, or doing some other menial task, I can still listen to an incredible book through Audible. And now you can get a free 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash sample chapter. By doing that, you'll not only have that 30-day trial, you'll also gain access to guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, A-list comedy, exclusive Audible originals, and even podcasts like the Sample Chapter Podcast. Last year is the first time I ever achieved my own personal reading goals and it was because of some wonderful titles I listened to on Audible. Some of those titles were Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline narrated by Will Wheaton, the Awaken Online series from Travis Bagwell narrated by David Stifle, Patient Zero by Jonathan Mayberry narrated by the incredible Ray Porter, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention previous guest Scott Meyer with his Magic 2.0 series narrated by Luke Daniels. It's a lot of fun and definitely worth your time. Hey, full disclosure, by signing up at audibletrial.com slash sample chapter, the show does get a little monetization, which goes directly towards any production needs uh, with the show. So you're also helping us out here by signing up. So what are you waiting for? 
Head on over now to audibletrial.com slash sample chapter and start your free 30 day trial today. All right. So that was audible. And uh, now we're going to jump over to our podcast friends, starting with pop goes the culture network and uh, their collection of about a dozen other uh, shows, all pop culture related uh, fanatics and the fan two days review. So many more. Uh, to listen, but it's all pop culture related. It's all about whether it's comics or TV or movies or, you know, celebrity news, uh, movie news, whatever. It's all there. They are talking about it regularly. And, uh, you know, I mentioned last week they have the uh, the flagship show, Pop Goes the Culture podcast, is doing a, a best of the 90s right now going on that there's a whole lot of other shows and and people part of, including us. And our pick for best movie of the 90s was The Fifth Element. Now, right now, (laughs) I'm fluctuating quite a bit. I was uh, starting off in first place and got down to second. And then me and and Tombstone keep going back and forth. So Fifth Element and Tombstone keep going back and forth for uh, second place. Oddly enough, I mean, I like this movie. I'm just surprised it's doing so well in the poll, and it's uh, Army of Darkness, you know, with Bruce Campbell, uh, This Is My Boomstick. It's a great movie. I really enjoy it. It's just a lot of dumb fun. I am i don't think I would put that ahead <laughs> of either Tombstone or the other. So, if you want to help me out, we have just a couple of days left uh, as of this recording. This is March 9th uh, when this is coming out, so we only have a couple of days left. Tell everybody... Get over to our Twitter poll or over to popgoesaculture.com. Click the link in the show notes and uh, get to their Twitter page so that you can vote for Fifth Element. Get us into the next round of best movies of the 90s. That's how you can help us out. But, you know, even if I don't win, even if I don't advance, it's a fun poll. Uh, Lots of things. There's eight rounds going on right now. You can vote in each of those and then uh, pay attention after Thursday or after Friday. Uh, You can uh, hear what the next one is. Finally, I want to thank Project Entertainment Network, our our new home that we've been with for about a year, home to about 35 other eclectic uh, podcast shows from writing, uh, from scary movies, monster movies, bizarre. There's uh, storytelling. Uh, there's a there's a, a lovely show on there where a lady is actually reading her story as she writs it. And then uh, she's going to be putting it together in book format later on. A whole bunch of different shows on there. Just so many to choose from. Uh, You know, shows like this one. What if a storytelling podcast could be an interactive experience? Hi, I'm Mariah Powell, amateur author and creator of Hobbies Include Writing. And I'm openly inviting your opinions on stories I haven't finished writing yet. Launching with my original audio novel, Blood That Binds, Visit hobbiesinclude-writing.weebly.com for more about the show and look for it on a podcasting platform near you. All right, once again, that was Project Entertainment Network, so make sure you click the link in the show notes for our podcast friends and sponsors alike. And, of course, today's guest, Gary Morgenstein, which, speaking of, let's go ahead and get us on over to that interview where we're going to find out, can baseball and faith save humanity? Dun, dun, dun. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Welcome back to another fantastic episode. I'm so thrilled to uh, welcome back to the show somebody I'm, I'm considered a friend, uh, Gary Morgenstein. Gary is a critically acclaimed author of the Dark Death series. Uh, which includes A Mound Over Hell that you heard about a year ago on the show in episode 118, so make sure you go back and listen to that, plus the upcoming uh, sequel to that, A Fastball for Freedom. Uh, This is the unique dystopian science fiction baseball saga. Gary has appeared on several podcasts and science fiction roundtables, as well as the popular Fanboy Nation and uh, Fellowship of Fools. He's an accomplished playwright, 
and his humorous new play about racial harmony, A Black and White Cookie. It was slated for premiere this year. We're going to find out about that and how that's going. And he's also the author of stage dramas, Saving Stan, A Tomato Can't Grow in Brooklyn, and the off-Broadway sci-fi rock musical, The Anthem. His work has been featured in New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, Parade Magazine, New York Post, Sports Illustrated, Fox News Radio, and NPR. And like I said, he was with us uh, in May last year for episode 118. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to the show, Gary Morgenstein. Gary, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing fine, Jason. Thanks so much for having me on. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you here, and it's been it's been great to get to catch up with you a little bit before sure. this, and and uh, hear how you're doing amidst the uh, the pandemic. Uh, hopefully, you're still finding inspiration through everything bagels and a schmear of cream cheese, or has yeah. that evolved? <laughs> no, it's still this still inspiring. It's still <laughs> inspiring, indeed. Um, uh, yeah, we, you know, I think that when people reacted to the pandemic, it kind of went into two camps. The people who said, oh, no, and kind of curled up in a bowl mm -hmm. and got very sad. And, and I don't fault them, please. That is not a criticism at all. And the people who said, all right, we got to go through this. And I just continue powering through. And A Fast Bowl for Freedom comes out March 25th from BHC Press. And it's the second book in the trilogy. And it picks up where Mount Overhell left off. Um, it's, you know, the question becomes, can... Uh, baseball and faith save humanity. And oh so, gosh. yeah, you know, minor themes, little minor themes like that. But <laughs> something, well, you know, just to remind people, it's uh, as the Mound Over Hell started, it began in 2098 after the United States and the West has lost uh, World War III to the Islamic Empire. And uh, America is surrounded. There's a new government. It's post democracy, post post. Socialism, all the sort of isms called the family. And some of the basic tenets are uh, that it's based on love and family relationships. And it doesn't matter what you are, just who you are. And, but then there are other things. For example, we could not be doing this because all social media was banned uh, under the anti narcissism Act. Mm. Uh, things like the entertainment industry, lawyers, uh, banks were banned under the anti-parasite laws. Uh, patriotism is outlawed. So there's a lot of, um, you know, think about social media. For example, um, th one of the, th the fundamentals of the, the, the government is that um, real relationships count, your family, your friends. And I don't want to dissuade anyone out there from believing otherwise, but the thousand friends you have on Facebook are really not your friends. And so it's more, you know, deep dive into that. And so as, and baseball is about to face its final season, baseball is considered part of a treasonous uprising against the government. And then uh, Mickey Bantle and Ty Cobb come back. In what form we're not, you know, we, I don't want to spoil a mound <laughs> over hell, but, um, and baseball's revived, but ultimately it, it falters again. And two of the main um, characters, Puppy Niedek and Annette Ramos, are accused of treason, of assassinating the head of the government, Grandma, and they flee to um, London, or the Caliphate of London. So, What's different in the in, in a big difference in book two is that I open the canvas broadly. So I would say about half the novel is set in London. So we see life in the caliphate and we see what it's like for people there. And especially through the eyes of Puppy and Annette, Puppy is considered a hero for having killed grandma, killed the enemy. Hmm. So, so, um, without giving, you know, I don't want to be too precious about spoilers You know, writers are, and it's like, okay, mm -hmm. you can't tell the story without telling something of the story. And, um, puppy is, they ask him to cut a propaganda video. And ultimately that leads to him having, um, a, a show, um, with Annette on the BBC to a look at, a, at the United States. Oh, so he's kind of, and then puppy in turn decides, well, I failed with baseball because at the end of a mound over hell, um, there's a government inspired terrorist attack and Yankee stadium is raised to the ground. And uh, puppy feels somehow responsible for having brought baseball back and then having thousands of people died um, because of that. And he, so he um, starts um, the Caliphate baseball association in London, hoping to bring Muslims and 
as they're called crusaders, um, together to play baseball. So it's, it's a lot darker than that. Meanwhile, in the United States, um, a new, there's a new leader, Albert Chang has taken over. He calls himself, uh, uh, grandpa, you know, kind of leaning into grandma and they bring back baseball. But the starting, what, what happens in book two is the control in America and the control in the caliphate over people begins to fray and there's cracks and people start thinking out of the box and begin challenging. And of course, in book two and ultimately in book three, which I'm working on now, a dug out to peace, um, baseball is going to be the theme. And faith. And faith, by, by faith, I don't mean religious faith. There is, in America, religion is banned. And certainly um, in the caliphate, there's only one religion allowed. Um, or, you know, the other religions, you know, Christianity, are more mocked than anything else. Uh, Judaism has been wiped out. Uh, so it's unnecessarily a specific religion as a faith in ourselves and a faith in each other. And that's always a theme in all my works. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and that's great because I mean, if faith does exist somewhere outside of religion. There's the faith yes. in, in mankind, the faith in each other and your family and, and so on. So that, that's a great theme to have in there. Well, we, because we need it. <clears throat> because how else do you bring people of divergent backgrounds together? unless you have faith in each other. You know, it's easy if you and I both belong to the same church or the same political party or the same club. Okay, that's easy. Then we have those bonds. But what about if we don't? Right. Are, are we, you know, are we doomed never to be friends? No, that's not, I don't believe that's how the world should be. Right. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our society, we're so polarized. And it's what I found interesting as the book was coming out, um, there's kind of parallels, you know, to what happened with this pandemic. Uh, people, you know, having to, ordinary people, the, the thing about all drama, all literature, whether it's novels, movies, plays, TV, it's about ordinary people rising above themselves hmm. and becoming heroes, mm -hmm. whether they want to be or not. And I think that's what I have um, in a festival for freedom. It's no superheroes <laughs> spider-man's not in the book at all there's no way close to spider-man it's just people who originally just wanted to get by like everyone around the world wants to get by they we we all of us no matter where we are despite the differences we just want our families to be well we want to be in love we want a job we want our children to be well we want to be happy we want a few bucks in our pockets uh i think i think what you lean into literature like that and look at it character driven i think readers respond better well said absolutely agree with you there well uh 2020 was an interesting year to say the least uh, yes. but it, it seems that you even though you had a few strikeouts some things that were yes uh, uh not trying to knock you out a little bit here and there you kept with it and uh black and white cookie was uh, ready to come out. Uh, where do we stand there? Well, we got postponed. We were going to premiere at Manhattan's Theater for the New City, March tw last March 26th. And, you know, man plans, God laughs, right? Mm -hmm. And so I decided, well, because of this wonderful device called Zoom, which you want to talk about bringing people together, that we should have a premiere via Zoom. And that went on. Um, we premiered in January. We had two shows. And it went great uh, for, you know, you don't usually get reviews for Zoom performances, <laughs> uh, but we got some lovely reviews. People really liked that. I mean, basically, if I can just briefly, a Black and White Cookie is about um, Harold Wilson. It's set in New York City in, in, in um, contemporary times in the East Village. And Harold Wilson is a kind of gruff, no-nonsense uh, African-American um, senior who um, finally reopens his newsstand after having to close for the shutdown and only to get hit by an exorbitant rent increase. And he, he has to close it up and retire to Florida with his um, niece, which is not going to make him too happy. So enter Albie Sands, a longtime customer who's an eccentric 1960s-style Jewish communist. And Albie persuades Harold 
to um, fight back. So it's about their unlikely friendship, overcoming prejudice. In this case, it's anti-Semitism, which is not usually um, dealt with in um, anymore, unfortunately, unless it's from Nazis, and which I find boring. But anyway, I don't want to, you know, get too far afield. So they form a, a powerful but unlikely friendship. And uh, we had a, a pre premiere in the UK last week, which was wonderful to hear my words with British accents. <laughs> and there's going to be another um, performance in um, in Washington, D.C. via Zoom. And I think there's another one I'm working on out west. So, I mean, that's the way to do things. To, you know, you, Zoom is interesting for performance. Yeah. Because it, it, for, for, say it's a theater. When you do a Zoom production of a play, it's really not so much theater as a hybrid of theater and film. Because you don't have to project to, to people <laughs> in, you know, row P, um, because you're up close. So it's very intimate. So it is more like film, yet the play, yet the material is often um, theatrical. It also has an element of audio drama when you have someone, you know, off stage doing the um, stage directions. So it's, it's very interesting how that comes about. And you could, there are obviously things you can't do. Uh, in Zoom, you can't have the physical uh, acting, but then again, who knows when we'll be allowed to have actors be physical and intimate on stage? We don't know, right? I mean, right? I mean, that's no one knows when that's when people are going to be be comfortable about that. So I um, so I think it's really interesting. Look, it's not the same as a live performance because you don't have the energy of the audience, you know, either good or bad. You know, as your playwright, you're sitting there saying, why aren't they laughing? Why aren't they laughing? They hate it. But <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's what you do. My very first play was Ponzi Man back in 2005. And I was sitting next to a friend of mine. And at the end of Act One, he nudged me. He says, you can breathe now, Gary, because it's like, you know, you're just all oh, you want to talk about tense muscles. Uh, so there's that. And what I'm also, if I could just talk about, well, on Zoom, talk about Joyland for a moment. So yeah. and, and things that I'm doing. Uh, or that I did during 2020. So my my co-creator Russell Friedman and I had developed um, uh, a TV scripted series called Joyland, set in the 1960s, which we like to believe is where so much of today began, so much of the polarization. And it's set between New York City, a lot of it is Brooklyn, begins in 1964, and a Catskills bungalow colony. And I'm sure a lot of people out there, what is that? A bungalow colony was um, small homes, small little bungalows, okay, in the Catskills Mountains uh, in, in New York State and scattered throughout, and there would be a pool, and it would be very rural. And where during, you know, from the 40s and 30s and 50s and 60s, working class, middle class, prepon preponderantly um, Jewish families would go for the summer. And so there was that. So it's, it's split. Now, we have an edgier, darker view of the Catskills bungalow colonies. It's not quite just splashing about in the pool, but we wanted something very different. And so it opens, um, the, the the pilot opens in July 1964, keyed off a real event where a cop, New York City cop, has um, shot and killed an unarmed African-American teen. And now there are riots. Well, what's changed? Right. You know, and I mean, that's it's kind of sad so much that you look back and Mm -hmm. um, not just on, on um, social justice issues, but um, just, you know, the corruption of the political system, the class warfare. So the, the, um, the, the, the see-through um, storyline is uh, this main character, Marty Dent, a former um, Knicks, New York Knicks basketball star who's fallen hard times, has a dream of bringing uh, an ABA franchise to Brooklyn. Now, the ABA starts in 1967. We're beginning in 1964. His best friend and former teammate, uh, Reverend Julian Bass, is the minister at the um, uh, First Baptist, First Church of uh, Baptist Church, First Church of Christ, who is dealing with civil rights back then. And okay. so it's an ensemble, and you have um, you have you know the rise of women's rights because as we remember from Mad Men, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know you know back in those days, a lot of what a woman woman did in the work world was, you know, oh, do you want um, milk and sugar in your coffee, sir? I mean, that's, you know, sadly, 
what it was. It wasn't that long ago. So we look at that very strong women, um, you know, moving forward in their careers. And um, so it's going. So what we've done is Zoom produced it. And it's going to go up on um, YouTube March 22nd. And the, and the reason for that is really simple. OK, the entertainment industry is in lockdown. You know, there's still this production stirring, but, you know, not like it, it should be. And we thought, OK, what if we Zoom produce season one, all eight episodes and, you know, add bells and whistles? For example, when there's a scene. So Gary and Jason are in um, a bungalow. OK, yep. so the, the file, the scene behind us is going to be the inside of a bungalow. Y you know, yeah. And they'll be all under school with music. And eventually, when we're allowed, we would like to film some scenes on location and weave them in. But basically, it's Zoom. Huh. And yeah, but it, and this is going to showcase it to the industry and say, look, I don't know if anyone else is doing this. I have no idea. But why not? And then we're hoping it's not a web series. So we're hoping that someone, a production company, a, a, a network will go, oh, this is a cool idea. This is, you know, really well written, well acted. And let's develop this for traditional. It's worth a shot. Again, what the pandemic has done to us is think differently. You know, we're all yeah. you and I, you know, we're ordinary heroes, just like people in our car in our novels, Jason. <laughs> And this is such a such a cool idea too to have that. You say you're doing it on Zoom, and then it's going to be on. Did you say YouTube? Yes. And that's on uh, March, March 20, 22nd. 20 yes. Just a few days before Fastball for Freedom. Yeah, I'm going to be a little busy. Yes. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> so, so. <laughs> and my wife's birthday is March 25th. Oh so, my goodness. Yeah, I better remember the flowers, or I'm. You know, it, it won't matter. Forget, I'm dead. <laughs> Well, now, I, and I think we may have touched on this previously, but what's it like for you uh, going back and forth uh, with the fiction writing with the uh, the Dark Death series? And, and so you're writing something that's OK, you're in in the moment, you're you're describing everything that's going on. And then the next day, maybe or maybe even the same day, uh, you're doing the screenwriting. And so now it's completely different. It's exterior you know, the, the bungalow, yes. you know, that's yes. going on. Right. What's that uh, like juggling back and forth or do you find that to be a, a problem? No, I don't find it a problem. Um, I find it refreshing. It okay. takes a little while to put the different hat on and to get back at it because I happen to be one of those very obsessed writers that I never stop writing, even though I'm, you know, you know what it's like. We're always yeah. writing in our heads. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, uh, I remember when my, um, my, my, we, we first got married, um, Marcita and I, um, you know, I would sit in the chair. She'd say, what's wrong? I'd say nothing. She says, well, you, you look very unhappy. I said, no, there's a scene in my head and my characters are unhappy. I'm perfectly fine. So you know what that's like. It's, <laughs> yes. You know, there's a reason, you know, show me a well-balanced writer and I'll show you an accountant because <laughs> come on, Jason, we're not, this <laughs> what we do is not, would not really pass muster as it's healthy, but whether it's. <laughs> you know, normal or uh, is something else. So I have to move back. I have to transition back and forth and leave one world behind. Um, yeah. and, and, but that's, it's, it's interesting. And you, when you write, for example, in um, when you write stories, you have rules that you have to follow those rules. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's an excellent question. That's the most important thing to keep in mind whatever world I go into to follow those rules. For example, in, you know, in a fastball for freedom, I'm in the 22nd century. So the diff different things have happened. People behave differently in, in some respects. You're allowed to do certain things or not allowed to do certain things that you could do now. Uh, right. In, in a mount over hell, one of the main characters, uh, Zelda Jones, she becomes pregnant and she's not married. Now in this world, you're not allowed to be a single mother because being a family is preeminent and it's believed that only two parents. Now, it could be, you know, two men, two women, man and woman. That's that's not the point, but it has to be two parents. So I thought, OK, well, I was so proud of myself. I got her pregnant. I said, oh, now what am I going to do? Uh, she, <laughs> You know, she can't go for she can't keep the baby. 
and she can't, there's no approved abortions because during World War III, America lost 17 million people. So they're, rest they're re restocking um, the supply of, <laughs> of, of children, uh, simple and crass as that. So she had to go to like a back room um, to explore getting an abortion, which she ultimately doesn't go through. So, you know, it's that sort of rules that you have to remember to follow. When you, if, if you're, a dystopian world is a world of, uh, a new world of new rules. And I think it's incumbent upon the writer, no matter how difficult you've done it for yourself, you must follow the rules or else Jason is going to say, what? That, you're just taking the easy way out. That doesn't, you know, you're not being consistent. I have, right. um, there's the, the three most revered mm -hmm. professions are um, cops, teachers, and doctors, because the thinking is if they are corrupt, lights out. Mm. We're in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So with the cops, um, there's blue shirts and brown hats, the detectives. But they don't, it's not like on television where they throw people against the wall or, you know, go and, you know, invade people's privacy. You're not allowed to do that. So when I have a police investigation in the book, it makes it much more difficult, much more challenging. Sometimes I'm like, well, why did you do that to yourself? But you have to do, and, and with Joyland, one of the, um, an interesting point in our, we had our first table read um, at the end of January, which is simply what it says. It's, you sit around and you read the script. And uh, one of the actors point had a, had a wonderful, uh, a wonderful point. He, he told everyone, he said, Remember, you're acting shocked by the material. You're acting shocked as if it was in 2021 when you're not allowed to use those words. Mm -hmm. But people back then use those words. That isn't to justify it, to excuse it in any way, shape or form. But that's how it was. History right. is kind of ugly. So you have to, <laughs> when someone calls you a blah, blah, you can't. Oh, it's. Right. You don't like it, but <clears throat> you're not going to go crazy. And again, it's the rules. It's the rules of the world that people have to get used to. There was a, uh, yeah, in the 1960s, well, was a lot of casual bigotry. Words were used, not endearingly, I'm not going <laughs> to <laughs> say that, but they were used thoughtlessly uh, without really intending to hurt someone. If I can, you know, I know I'm going to get in trouble because I know we, we in our society, you can't explain any longer why something was without being uh, pinned for agreeing with it and embracing it, which I'm not at all. But, all right. mm -hmm. you know, when people talk that way, that's just how it was. You <clears throat> were a blah, blah. And all you people do that. It, it wasn't to hurt you. It was how you believed or how, right. you know, I was too young. You know, I was just a kid at that time, but that's how people believed back then. Yeah, yeah, and gosh, I mean, thank goodness social media wasn't around. Yes. Oh, back geez. then. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Oh man, and, and I like what you were saying uh, previously about the uh, you know changing of the hats and uh, understanding the rules and, and kind of taking a moment to. Um, I get into the work a little bit before suddenly you're enveloped into it. Um, <laughs> I've developed a habit when I'm, when I'm editing, especially of uh, putting a hand on my head uh, and I get this real stern look on my face and I don't realize <laughs> I'm doing it. And the same thing, my wife will look at me or my kids will look at me at like, dad, are you all right? Like, yeah. 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 I'm just shh, trying to think. And they're like, no, you, you get a headache. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, apparently I'm trying to keep the thoughts in my head so they don't float away or something. I don't know what I'm doing, but it's just like, oh, no, no. And I put my hands down, I'll start typing, but then I'm also I'm grabbing the back of my head again, going like, ah, what is this? <laughs> so, well, so it's better than taking meds, right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, which we, we probably would be on if we didn't have this outlet. Pe people, you know, people don't realize how hard it is to write. They yes. just, right, they think, oh, I have a story idea, I'm, I should write now. I say, yeah, go ahead. Good luck with that. You know, maybe you're Jesus, and I'm. I wish you God bless you. But I, I a fastball for freedom in book form is 480 pages. So that was like 650 manuscript pages. I did at least eight drafts, and I'm talking. My gosh. A to Z drafts, not the kind of drafts we all do as writers. 
you know, the, that day polishing, the next mm-hmm. day going back, you know, but whether it's like standard operating procedure, right. because I'm very, you know, anal and I'm always catching something. And when you write, you know, again, if you write science fiction, as I do, um, you know, you must show respect. I think, in fact, I think all writers should show respect. In in, in this the, the series, I deal with um, Islam. And I'm very proud that at least for a mound over hell, only one person accused me of being Islamophobic. Hmm. On, you know, on Amazon, some review. Oh, but because I went to, even though I showed a harshness under the caliphate, I showed people who were against it. And I was very careful to show the religion respect and to try to explain things. Um, and it's not an attack, but this is a world. I've created this world. This is the, these these folks are in it along with everyone else, and they get the same treatment as everyone as everyone. And I think that's you know, you, as a writer, you you have to do that. You have to do your research. I was always looking up you know the right names to use, uh, you know the right foods to use. Hmm. It's yeah, it's mm-hmm. uh, it, 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 it's a process to be there. It, it really is. Yeah. There, there's a lot. It, it's amazing. The things that you, uh, the things we have to become professional at almost or, or semi pro, um, at just to be able to describe a couple of lines Yes. of something. <laughs> so yes, my, my, uh, the book I'm writing is a sci-fi dystopian that takes place oh. a few years after an alien invasion. And it, it's, it takes place in the eighties. So my hardest thing was trying to decide which year and yeah. what, what movies am I missing out on if I do this year going forward, but which movies will I have and how long is it going to, how long will like chocolate cupcakes hostess cupcake <laughs> right. be good for, uh, for my young protagonist. And yes, uh, <laughs> cause he, you know, of course he wants to hoard them and, hang on to him. I'm like, well, yeah, originally I thought, oh yeah, he's been in hiding for five, six years. Well, I, unfortunately he can't keep hostess cupcakes good that long. So <laughs> that was <laughs> things I learned. It's amazing. The stuff as a writer, we have to learn and figure out and go, oh, darn it. Well, now and what when, do I do? <laughs> yes. And when people read it, they have no appreciation of what you did. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, but they have no idea. They think it just no. came off the top of our head. Right. Which is to your credit because there's no you don't see the sausage being made it's seamless i oh gosh i love that i think you said that before too and i love that that's a great phrase yes so uh fastball for freedom uh book two in it now did you all along plan this to be a series or was it just kind of yes yes i did and i thought originally i thought it might be longer than a trilogy but i think in publishing Nowadays, uh, the trend is to trilogies. That's what I'm told. Mm, okay. That the long book series, I mean, I guess if you're George R. R. Martin, you know, you, you could do that. <laughs> um, but for the most part, uh, people prefer to wrap it up in three books. And so there's always this arc in my head to, um, to get to a dugout to peace and to um, wrap up is because there's always going to be, you know, you can't make everything neat. There's going to be some characters who you just have to wonder about what happens to them. That's true. You That's know, true. So, so, so I've done, um, so I, I did my ample research and it's also fun because you know, I'm a big baseball fan, uh, projecting baseball in the 22nd century. And what we have, you know, opening day, um, 2099, uh, what that's like. And in fact, I was thinking, um, maybe I might just, read that it's it's only a you know when we get around to me reading from it um i could maybe even read that if you'd like oh uh sure yeah i i'm, I'm up for any of those so that'd be yeah it sounds great yes <clears throat> well uh so and you said uh you're working on book three right now um, yes a dug out to peace yes okay what yes the do you have a timeline for that do you think or uh or, or i guess it's going to de- determine on I, Joyland and uh, Black yes. and White Cookie. Yes. Yeah. Well, it'll depend on Joyland. I already was wrote uh, about half of the first draft. Okay. So, so then I got a little sidetracked by Joyland, but I'll go back to that. Uh, you know, the beauty, as you know, the beauty of writing, my wife once, um, when I started Fastball for Freedom, she created like a genius board for me. 
and of wood and everything. And I spent hours with post-its, putting up all my ideas and my character arcs, and I never looked at it again. <laughs> and so it, it, I like to be surprised by my characters. I like mm-hmm. to have some general sense. I have a, a, a pretty general, you know, a decent enough idea where I'm going. But I don't like to, you know, there are so many things in the Fastball for Freedom characters came out of nowhere, were created. You know, they thought they would be like, you know, it's like when you create a character, you think it's just that scene. Yeah. And then they don't leave. It's like, okay, you got to go. No, no. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's for dinner? You know, can I have some wine? Right. And they stick around. I have more to say. I, that's you know right. This about me. Yeah. Yep. And it's, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's it really a wonderful is. thing. It, it's, it's really wonderful to do. So, um, so that I like that. And I like when plots and, and we know, of course, when you write that sometimes the characters take over and that sounds so precious and trippy and oh, aren't you cute, but really that's what happens. You're sitting there writing and the characters say, no, are you, sh- you're a schmuck. It's not supposed to be that way. I would never say that. I would never do that. What's wrong with you? Get out of the way. Let me take over. And they really do. It's, and you say, whoa. Where'd that come from? And it's, you know, you want to talk about um, having this, whatever, whatever craziness leads you to be a writer. And there is something that create that pushes you to be a writer, to have that outlet is, is wonderful. I mean, I had a very dysfunctional family and so um, growing up, so I would hide in my room and write. It's really as simple as that. The world I created when I was a little boy writing was vastly better than the screaming and yelling outside my bedroom door. Mm, mm -hmm. And it allowed me to, to, to deal with that. I think uh, I'm sure many writers have had that experience. Yeah. Yeah. I I think so. Yeah. You hide and you hide in your world. As long as you come out, (laughs) (laughs) that's like, you've got to come out. You can't just spend, all your time in that world, because that's really bad. Okay. That's when you need the meds. But if you could create those worlds, which is so raw, um, such pure emotion, and then invite people in. And, and to me, the beauty is when people share your experience, when people will spend time, you know, a long time reading a book and will spend money or they'll come to see your play and they'll honor you by wanting to um, be one with your imagination. It's, it's, it's really something so special. special, special. Um, you know, when, when you have write a play, you have people in the audience, of course. But novels, as you know, is, you never know. When someone, you're not seeing someone read your book. Right. You know, it's a very right. strange feeling. And then someone tells you, some, talks about it, and it's, Wow. And they have a different perspective of things, which is great because your blue and my blue is not the same blue. <laughs> right? So That's you're all going to be, yeah. right? And, and people say, well, did I, they'll talk about the book. They say, did I get that right? I said, there's no wrong or right. You know, you didn't, as long as you didn't get a character's name wrong, it's what you thought. And if you thought that happened, the way it happened because of why it happened, that's why it happened. Don't ask me what I want to, because as soon as, I mean, a fastball for freedom is completely out of my hands now. I have nothing to do with it. I can come here and discuss it with you, but in terms of it being a creation, it's in the hands of people who are going to read it. My goodness. You know, and I'm lucky that's so so far, some of the early reviews have been very good. So I'm very, what one person said, it's the Empire Strikes Back of the series. Which isn't too shabby. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, not too shabby at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, speaking of sharing work, uh, where where do we go to find information about Joyland so that we can uh, so listeners can tune in on the twenty second of, of March? That's a good question. Um, uh, you could go to my um, website, GaryMorganstineAuthor.com, and there will be material. Or certainly on Facebook, I am there. Please check me out, or at at Writer Gary on Twitter. It should be all over the place. And for my novels, it's um, uh, go to 
on my author page at bhcpress.com. Okay, yep, yeah, and I've got all of those notes written down. We'll have Thank links you. for those um, and the uh, the link for Joyland Austria, if I can find that and put that in the show notes as well so that everybody can get this because this episode should drop at least a week or two before uh, both of these release. So that oh, way great. people can uh, click on the That's links and, uh, and get in there. So, Gary, thank you so much. This has been oh, a, a real pleasure. joy again talking with you. And I just I just love sitting back and, and quietly just listen to you uh, go on about uh, the writing and the process and how it relates to life. And, and I just I love it. I, you have so much to talk about that I, I really enjoy. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, time to uh, step aside have myself a little bit of uh, coffee and help my uh, <clears throat> my throat a little bit again. And uh, we're going to listen to our guest, Gary Morgenstein, with his latest book, A Fastball for Freedom. Well, I thought I, at the end of the day, I thought like Glinda, the good witch of the North, said it's always best to start at the beginning. So I'm going to start with chapter one. On puppy Needick's first morning in the Caliphate of England, he was wakened by a defaced statue of Jesus crashing near his head, but he was too damn sick to care. Get up, puppy, and at Ramos yanked him upright, where he wobbled like a very weary doll. The ground convulsed from another explosion, shattered marble flying around the bleeding, terrified goats running through the desecrated church of all saints. Crouching, Annette narrowly avoided a dive-bombing chicken crashing into the pew. The fowl's blood spurted onto the groggy puppy's head. He peered in profound surprise at the red liquid as his ex-wife tugged him along by his right shoulder which felt like was about to come off. Everything hurt down to the roots of his thinning black hair. Staccato bursts of machine gun fire knocked out a stained glass window. A squat priest with clipped gray hair nimbly jumped over the shards like a frantic frog and helped the net lift her puppy. This way, hurry, Father John Dempsey shouted, leading them through the animal feces and the pieces of Jesus, puppy's rubbery legs peddling like a cartoon character. What's going on, Annette asked. Someone's attacking London, Dempsey said. London, puppy's mind cleared slightly. Wishing it hadn't, he retched. A chandelier fell. The 200-year-old fixture, which had survived three world wars, finally surrendering and spitting pieces of glass. Kicking aside hysterical goats, Dempsey sidestepped two pigs charging from opposite ends. Annette menacingly waved her fist to warn the animals away from the stumbling puppy. Another bomb shook the church and the terrified pigs collided. It was like a farm gone wild. Dempsey knocked over a battered old wooden table, lifting a metal door and frantically gesturing into the dark. Can you make it, Dempsey asked Puppy. I struck out 14 batters at Yankee Stadium, he said indignantly, his eyes lolling. And that shot the priest a worried look. They lowered Puppy down the steps like a really big bag of potatoes, where he landed on his knees in the dank cellar. Following, Annette tenderly rubbed his forehead, frowning at the hot flesh. You okay, honey? Puppy shrugged, there being no easy answer, though the pain ripping into his side nurtured some recollection. The priest turned on a small flashlight and slid the overhead door closed, barely muting the screams of dying animals. Dempsey handed out bottles of water stashed beneath a battered desk. I'm sorry, there's no food. It's okay, he probably should eat anyway. Why not, Puppy grumbled, suddenly starving. Because you're on antibiotics. Right. The Arab woman doctor stitching him up on the bathroom floor. Dempsey looked between them knowingly. You've been married a long time. We're divorced, Annette said, tamping down the thick black curls staking about his shoulders. But he can't get along without me. She clucked her tongue over the blood stains on his bandages. Dempsey fumbled for a pack of open gauze on the shelf. That's not clean. Grandma's bra strap, she'll give him an infection. Annette placed herself between the priest and puppy. I study nursing. Four lessons, puppy weakly held up his fingers. Enough to know not to use old bandages that have been exposed to dirt and animal shit. She cradled his head, glaring at Dempsey. Dempsey stared a moment, assessing their accents and brash manners. You're Americans. Maybe, Annette answered carefully. Maybe's the most definition I've had in a while. He smiled at a grimace. John Dempsey, I'm the priest here at the Church of All Saints. They exchanged cautious stares. It's okay. I wouldn't trust me either. Dempsey waited for the rolling thunder to pass. I've not had a parishioner in more than ten years. Maybe you'd get more visitors if you clean things up a little. The priest laughed bitterly. It's supposed to be this way. What are your names? Annette poked Puppy when he started answering. Dempsey nodded with sad understanding. 
All the churches throughout the caliphate are used to pen animals, although some are also used as public toilets. We're supposed to remember the filth of our beliefs. That said, they still encourage worshippers. I know, he waved off their blank stares. It might not make sense. The Muslims believe that if you're a true believer, even in the evil that's Christianity, you'll make a sacrifice to continue praying to your God. In a strange way, they think they're helping us by leading people to God while reminding them we're worshipping false values. There was actually an imam I met once at a program called Ilm, which is Arabic for knowledge. Dempsey paused. They had no idea what he was talking about. They really are from America, where they think you could just lock God out of your house. Well, you've changed the locks a number of times, haven't you? Still haven't found the new key. All right, everybody, that was Gary Morgenstein reading a sample chapter from his upcoming book in the Dark Death series, A Fastball for Freedom. It is book two of the series, comes out March 25th, but you can pre-order it right now through BHC Press, um, and I think it's on Amazon as well, so you can go there, but click the link in the show notes for all of that and find out uh, whether or not baseball and faith can save humanity. Hey, don't forget to also click the link in the show notes for our podcast friends and sponsors alike and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out next time when we're back with a new author a new book and an all new sample chapter take care everybody we'll see you again real real soon this has been a presentation of the project entertainment network